Uh, first, can I say uh, what a pleasure it is to be invited here and to be in this wonderful city and indeed wonderful country. Thank you. And, and secondly, can I say that I'm completely amazed to see an audience of orthopedic surgeons on a Friday afternoon prepared to listen uh, to an Englishman talk about placebo. That is really extraordinary. This would not happen in England, trust me on that. So, uh, well done for staying, and indeed well done uh, the organisers for thinking of putting on a session in an orthopaedic meeting about placebo. Brilliant. So, um, who am I? Well, um, I'm very old, so I'm an emeritus professor now uh, at the University of Exeter Medical School. I also have a scholarship from the Institute for Integrative Health in Baltimore. So. Uh, those two institutions are my funders, and I'd just like to acknowledge and thank them. So, uh, I, I was a physician uh, in my working life, uh, not a surgeon, I'm sorry about that. But my research interests are osteoarthritis and joint replacement, as well as placebo and healing. So, because I've had an interest in osteoarthritis and joint replacement for many years, I'm actually quite used to standing up in front of audiences of orthopaedic surgeons. I know a little bit about how you work and think, so I will speak very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, have that, you have that feel about yourselves all the way, all around the world. Let me tell you, actually, I have enormous respect and admiration for what you do, but the jokes are fun as well. <laughs> So what I'd like to briefly talk about in this presentation is first of all the distinction between the placebo response and placebo effect, then uh, the psychological theories of how placebo works, then some of the biological theories of how placebo works, and then a slightly different approach to how placebo might work. So, uh, first of all, the placebo response versus the placebo effect. So, the placebo idea is, is just an artificial construct derived from ra randomized controlled trials. It's a, it's a meaningless idea, really. It was discovered that if you give a sham treatment, people get better, and that kind of confused trialists and led to us talking about this placebo thing. The important thing it teaches us, though, is that you can make people better or worse without a real intervention like surgery. So that's the importance of it. The dummy treatment bit is actually really irrelevant. So this is the discovery, as you've already seen from the previous presentation. If you do a trial and you try your treatment, you get an effect, and you have a, a sham, a dummy, but you get quite a big effect, and the only bit you're really interested in is this bit, and that's just a nuisance, and that's the placebo response. But the interesting bit is if you then have a no treatment control group, and you find that you've still got quite a big difference here, and that's the placebo effect, and that's extraordinary really, if you compare doing nothing with giving nothing, you do nothing or you give nothing, if you give nothing, you get a much better effect than if you do nothing, and that's the placebo effect, and that is, remarkable, uh, and it's huge. So it's actually responsible for most of the effect of antidepressants, as Irving Kirsch has shown. It's responsible for most of the analgesic activity of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, as Wei Zhang has shown. And it's a major component of the response to surgical procedures, as Jonas and others have shown. So this is a huge thing. Uh, the efficacy, as was mentioned by Thomas right at the beginning, uh, has been calculated uh, to be around 0.5, which is big. Uh, but that's the efficacy, that's artificial setting. The effectiveness in clinical practice we don't really know because it's difficult to work out. But uh, it's been estimated that placebo effects are responsible for about 75% of the pain relief achieved with any intervention for painful osteoarthritis. So whatever we do, we're mostly just doing placebo. So how does it work? Well, 
There are uh, three psychological theories, first of all, which I'll briefly talk about, expectation, conditioning, and meaning. Now, the dominant theory is that expectation. So the dominant theory of the psychologist is that what happens is what we expect to happen. A slightly bizarre idea, in a sense, because, of course, expectations or our beliefs about what will happen are complex, and they're not single. So we have big beliefs. We might have a big belief that God will look after us in the end. We might have a little belief that maybe herbs would better be better for us than surgery. But we've got lots of mixed up beliefs. So it's not as simple, I think, as the literature would have us suggest. But having said that, it can work to a fairly extraordinary level. So placebo experiments, for example, have shown that if you give people a cup of coffee and you tell them it's got caffeine in it, they will often get the physiological and psychological response to caffeine, even if there's no caffeine in it. So the heart rate goes up, they will start getting agitated, all those types of things, but there's no caffeine at all. Conversely, if in a trial, or indeed in a clinical situation, you tell people that there'll be some side effects of the treatment, they're quite likely to get those side effects, even if you have a dummy treatment or don't do anything. And of course, the implications of that for the way we deal with our patients are huge. What do we tell people that they should expect? How do we deal with what they've read on the internet or whatever? And in trials, and this is something that really bothers me, what are we doing with our consent form to a trial? We're telling people to expect something. So of course, that's going to happen. So trials are almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. And uh, it works in orthopedics. Um, so as you know much better than I do, joint replacement's a good intervention for hips and knees, but it doesn't work in everybody. Some 20 to 25% of people who have a knee replacement don't do well, for example. But one of the predictors of whether you'll do well or badly from, from joint replacement surgery is your expectations. The higher the expectations, the better you will do. So this is relevant to even uh, 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 a so-called brilliant, perfect, rational, mechanical intervention uh, such as a joint replacement. Now, the second uh, theory is conditioning. I don't think this is terribly relevant to orthopedics, but it's quite interesting to those of us uh, who research this area. So this theory suggests that placebo effects are due to our being conditioned to respond to an intervention like Pavlov's dogs. So most people don't have multiple uh, replacements of the same joint, so I think it's quite difficult to be conditioned to it, to the outcome. <laughs> Although you do mess some of them up and do it again and again, but that's another story. Um, uh, but it can work with some of the medicines that us physicians use. There's some lovely experiments done by uh, Gerbel where He's showed that you can immunosuppress people, but if you give the immunosuppressant with a nasty tasting green slime, after a couple of goes, you can get full-blown immunosuppression just with the green slime. And actually this is being used to try to reduce the amount of immunosuppression you have to use, for example, after uh, a transplantation. So conditioning can work and is much more important in, uh, for us physicians than for you surgeons, I think. And then the third psychological theory of how it works is the so-called meaning effect, uh, as uh, uh, developed, an idea developed by Dan Moorman, an anthropologist in the States, who wants to reconceptualize placebo as the meaning response. And he attributes it to a change in the meaning that your illness has to you, or changing your story of yourself. So um, those are the psychological theories, and briefly, a case report which kind of shows that this can work in real life. So some years ago I saw a professor of medicine who came to see me with severe hip pain radiating down his leg and he was convinced that he needed a hip replacement. Uh, there was osteoarthritis in the family, uh, his father had been in a wheelchair as a result of it, he was pretty sure he was going the same way. But examination and x-rays were normal, and he came to me as a so say expert in osteoarthritis and told me to arrange the hip replacement. 
And uh, I spent a bit of time trying to convince him that the pain was coming from his back and not from his hip. But my first, first go at that was completely unsuccessful. He stormed out of my consulting room saying, you call yourself a consultant rheumatologist? You can't even tell the difference between hip pain and back pain. Who do you think you are? He was furious with me. But um, he came back and I was prepared next time. So I'd got out some literature about uh, pain radiation from the spine to uh, show to him, to try to convince him, because the professor of medicine wanted to read a paper that might be relevant. So he did. And when I had convinced him, his pain disappeared. His pain just went uh, completely. Uh, so that was a placebo effect. And it was caused by altered expectations and a change of meaning of what was going on. But it couldn't have happened until he felt able to trust me and believe in me and alter his belief. Uh, the reason um, I remember this story very well is that he used to send me a case of wine every Christmas uh, for making his hip pain better, which of course I didn't do, he did. Um, but that's why I remember it and it was very nice wine. So as well as the um, uh, psychological theories, there are biological theories of how placebo works. Now, these days, as I'm sure you know, you can't really go to a medical scientific meeting and present a paper without bringing along a brain scan. Because everybody believes in brain scans, so they have to be there. And apparently, they do show how placebo works. But I don't understand any of that. And I don't have any brain scans to show you. <laughs> so I'm sorry, but apparently they prove it. I don't know. I think it's 21st century phrenology, actually. It's just phenomenology. It doesn't prove anything. But anyway, the brain scans change. And other things people do in this field is they measure chemicals like endorphins. I guess it's good fun if you know how to do it. Uh, I don't really understand that either, but the fact is that naloxone, uh, which of course blocks the effects of morphine, also blocks the pain relief from placebo. So it is probably mediated in the brain by endorphin release. And uh, there's also evidence for activation of descending inhibitory pathways of pain control. So what this biology, biological research shows uh, is that you get changes in the nervous system which switch on pain relieving pathways when you give a dummy treatment, when you give a placebo and you get pain relief. And so my professor friend would have had endorphin release and inhibitory pain pathways switched on once he believed in me. Of course that doesn't really explain anything uh, because it would be pretty weird if it could occur without changes in the nervous system. But sure enough, we can show that those nervous system changes occur. And actually, some of the most elegant and exciting research in this field is with Parkinson's disease, where the placebo effect is truly remarkable. But I think there's a problem with all this. Is it really just about what's going on in the brain of the patient? That's what the research is now. All the research in placebo is about what's happening in the patient's brain. And I think that's actually missing the whole point. Because what it's really about, or the way it's switched on or not, is about the interaction between us as individuals. And there are both uh, psychological and neurophysiological theories uh, about how uh, these interpersonal factors work. And I just, to end with, want to briefly share with you uh, one psychological theory and one neurophysiological theory of how the effects of the way we interact with our patients changes everything. Uh, and th the particular theories I'm going to talk about are chosen simply because they're the ones that my group has been using in our research. So the psychological theory I'd like to share with you is of validation and invalidation. Uh, this is a communication theory which has been developed in the context of dialectical behavior therapy, that's a particular form of behavioral therapy used in uh, psychology and psychiatry. And what it is about is the communication of it, understanding of another person. 
uh, invalidation communicates that you haven't really understood them at all. And this is a bit more than empathy and compassion. There's a lot of talk about empathy and compassion in our business. But that's not enough. You can be compassionate, you can be empathic, but if the patient hasn't noticed that, you get nowhere. In other words, if the patient doesn't feel that you have validated them, you have really understood them, then however hard you've tried, uh, you're not going to get a good response. And that's something I'll talk briefly about at the end of the afternoon again. And validation and invalidation depend on how you behave, your body language and everything else, as well as what you say. Now, the neurophysiological theory that relates to this is the polyvagal theory of social interaction developed by uh, Stephen Porges uh, in Chicago. Now, this theory is about the fight or flight response, which you all know about, that if we feel threatened, we get very anxious, we get uh, excited, uh, that's our fight or flight response. If it gets extreme, we just shut down. And these are responses, automatic responses, to protect us uh, from predators, from threat, to help us run away more quickly uh, from the mammoth. But what Stephen Porges has shown is that in higher animals like humans, we have an opposite system that helps us work in groups and helps us nurture our young, because our young are completely useless for a long time, uh, and it's best that we don't kill them all off. We're getting so frustrated with the young baby who's just crying and all the rest. And we don't kill them off because we nurture them. And this is the nurture, nurturing response, and it's sort of epitomized by what happens to most human beings when they see a picture like this, or better, can cuddle the baby and see it smile. Then you relax, your heart rate goes down, you feel good, you feel uh, that the world's uh, an okay place, and you want to look after that baby, and you feel for it. You have your nurturing response switched on by a baby's smile. Uh, and we're hardwired for this through the vagus, uh, just as we're hardwired for fight or flight. But the other intriguing thing about this is that when the nurturing response is activate, we activated, we can communicate with other people much better. So I'm feeling, this is quite surprising really, but I'm feeling reasonably safe in front of an audience of orthopedic surgeons. So because I'm feeling reasonably safe, uh, my voice is modulated, it's going up and down, I'm able to look you in the eye, I'm actually picking up the way that you're responding to me. Some of you are listening, I know that. <laughs> yeah, see, not a lot, but some. Um, Whereas, if I was frightened of you, I would be talking like this, I would not be able to look like you, at you at all, and I would not know what is going on in this room. That's what happens if you switch on the threat response. You don't communicate, you don't hear anything. And that's why, if a patient's in your consulting room, and you say something like, well, I don't think it's cancer, all they hear is the word cancer. They hear nothing else, that frightens them, and whatever you say after that, you're just wasting your time. Because they're now in threat mode, all they've heard is cancer, they go out of the room and after they've calmed down a bit, they tell their spouse, he thinks I've got cancer. So this is powerful stuff because it affects what we hear, it affects how we communicate. And uh, the reason I'm putting these two theories in front of you as crucial to placebo and indeed nocebo is really the work of uh, one of my PhD students, Maddie Greville Harris, uh, who uh, did a thesis that I think shows reasonably convincingly that in order to activate a placebo response, and I've already told you how big and important that is, someone has to feel safe and you have to validate them. They have to feel safe, and they have to feel you've understood them. And then you will get uh, the full effect of this remarkable phenomenon of the placebo. 
so my conclusions are first that it's a major component of the response of interventions to everything and we do including surgery expectations are making new meaning are important psychological mediators of the effect and it is also mediated through strange and weird things happening in your brain and spinal cord but for me the critical bit of this is what happens with patient practitioner interactions and the need for us to make our patients feel safe and to validate their experience thank you questions discussion I have a question about the amount of placebo effect if you measure it by some outcome for example pain outcome score scale does that change and then in addition if you have a outcome which is more like yes or no <laughs> something happens or not happen what is the placebo effect in that case okay thank you that's a good question so yes it's fairly easy to show major changes on uh, standard measures like say uh, a visual analog pain scale uh, because one of the problems with all of this is that the research is all done in a very artificial sort of context so that the some of the other effects that the first speaker was talking about interfere with this but experiments constructed to compare uh, various interventions to try and conceal what's going on have been done particularly for acute pain there's a researcher in Italy called Fabrizio Manadetti who's done a lot of this work and for example he uses dental pain and he will set a drip up and he'll tell people that there will be some morphine in the drip at various time points and then he will sometimes give morphine and sometimes he won't but he'll tell them it's morphine <coughs> now if you set up an experiment like that you can show that when you don't give morphine but they think it's morphine you get a huge change in something like a pain score and indeed you can get effects that are big enough to get a yes no response what is more difficult uh, to be sure of is whether you're also getting changes in pathology or physiology certain physiological changes in the autonomic nervous system are consistently shown with dummy treatments but whether placebo actually affects say the growth of a tumor or something like that we don't know some people think it does some people think it doesn't does that answer your question perhaps not <laughs> i think <laughs> not <laughs> okay <laughs> Palaneva, Central Finland Hospital. Uh, thank you very much for your great presentation. And I'd like to ask, uh, what would happen if you give the patient an effective treatment, but say that there will be no effect in yes. that treatment? So I wonder if I could call it sham placebo or something. <laughs> yes. Now that, that's an excellent question. And, and what happens is that it's much less likely to work your effective treatment is much less likely to work if you tell them it's not going to work. Now, I've been quite careful in my language so far this afternoon. That may change later, but um, <laughs> I haven't been very insulting to orthopedic surgeons, which is unusual, actually. But um, I've been quite careful to say may and sometimes, because the placebo and indeed the nocebo response which is what you're talking about blocking a response by telling them it won't work which is part of the nocebo phenomenon the opposite of placebo they work better in some subjects than others and also very intriguingly some doctors are better at inducing placebo and nocebo effects than others 
So it's probably all to do with how convinced they were about what you told them and your body language and the context in which it was. Things I'll talk briefly about at the end of the afternoon. Uh, so that you can't be sure it won't work. It might still work brilliantly because they thought you were a bit of an idiot when you said it wouldn't work, perhaps. But you, you've got a good chance of blocking it if you do that. <laughs>